Okay, I'll try and keep this reasonably uh, short and sweet. Uh, I want to talk about uh, something to do with Anselm's ontological argument, but it's not the usual thing that's mentioned with Anselm's ontological argument. What actually got me thinking about this yesterday was watching a couple of videos by James Das, American Atheist, on the subject of Anselm's ontological argument. And he did something rather different to most videos on it, which is he gave a bit of background to it. Then he did something that which was rather more usual, which was to look at philosophical arguments against Anselm's ontological argument. Well, I want to do something which I think is actually in some ways the elephant in the room. It's something that should be staring us all in the face, and yet amazingly it seems to be overlooked 99% of the time. Looking at the comments on James's videos, looking at other videos out there on the same subject, I can find really no comment on this whatsoever, and I find it rather startling. And this is a problem with Ansel's argument that, that, that is not philosophical uh, in nature. It's not a problem with the actual proof itself. In fact, we can embrace the proof with this problem. The problem is with the application. And it's an application that's gone on throughout the centuries. It's an application that's still being made from people such as William Lane Craig when he uses it to uh, infer the basic properties of God. God, the creator of our universe. Well, here's the problem. You know, I could attempt now to try and prove to you uh, that I've got a father, okay? So I could show you some pictures of uh, Barack Obama. I'm going to evidence the existence of Barack Obama. I'm going to show you some pictures. I'm going to show you some video footage. I'm going to show you testimony by people who have spoken to Mr. Barack Obama. But if I then claim to you that I've now demonstrated that my father is a mixed-race president of the United States, you would say, hang on a minute, before you go any further, uh, Jim, you've just demonstrated the existence of Barack Obama. What you haven't done is gone anywhere, anywhere close towards demonstrating that Barack Obama is your father. It would be blindingly obvious if I was to try and pull that stunt wouldn't it? And yet that's exactly what happens with Anselm's ontological argument, which is that it isn't demonstrating anything about the creator of our universe. We have to assume for no reason whatsoever that this entity that's being trumped up via Anselm's argument is the creator of our universe. But does it have to be? Well, of course it doesn't. Even if it was the, the overall primordial being, if you like, it could have created lots of beings of its own. And then one of those beings that it could created could have created it, a, a universe. And in that universe, there could be creatures such as ourselves, except that they become technologically far more advanced than themselves. And they, be, they can harness some of the cosmological ideas that we can only dream of. And they actually manage to trigger a bubble universe forming. And in that bubble universe we happen to exist. Okay, so does all of this really matter? Well, if you're defending an, an, an Abrahamic monotheistic position or anything even remotely similar, then yes, it's absolutely fundamental. Because it is the direct creator of our universe that is what you are describing in the Genesis account. It's the direct creator of our universe that gives moral commands. It, it, so, so it's the qualities of the direct creator of our universe, whether or not they are omniscient, whether or not they are omnipotent, whether or not they are omnibenevolent, uh, whether they are a suitable moral lawgiver that is all important. In fact, this is exactly the bit of mischief that William Lane Craig did right at the beginning of his discussion with Sam Harris a few months back. He brought up Am Anselm's argument, not so much to demonstrate God's uh, omniscience and omnipotence, but to demonstrate he derived from it his omnibenevolence and thereby his credentials as a moral lawgiver. But what Craig had smuggled under the table is he never explained how he got from the existence of this maximally great being to a simply assuming and then asserting that this maximally great being was the direct creator of our universe, was the entity that is making an issue 
issuing via scripture or otherwise divine commands to us. Okay, well, I think I've gone far enough with that. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. That, that's a problem I have, not with Anselm's argument itself, with the philosophical side, but just the way that it's it's applied or, or misapplied or overapplied and deleted, as you see, appropriate there. I always like to think of the defences that people could make, you know, to arguments such as this. I, I think the first defence that a lot of people would immediately think is, well, thinking back to Anselm's premises, surely this maximally great being, surely direct creation is greater than, than indirect creation via a series of intermediates. So the direct create, for God to have directly created our universe would be greater than to have indirectly created our universe. The problem is that we know that things are indirect created within our universe because we create some of them so then we could have an even greater god still if direct creation superseded indirect creation so i don't really think that's a, that that really floats uh, as a retort if you have got a retort that you think floats let's let's have it I, I, it just seems to me that this is a this is one of the this is an elephant in the room kind of situation here it's so blindingly obvious that it's kind of overlooked you have this perfect being it doesn't mean it's the creator of our universe okay well it's good to be back thank you for watching this video uh, bye for now